there's another trade agreement that's really important that I know um, is, is maybe absorbing more attention than the transatlantic, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Can you tell us the status of that and what's in it for uh, businesses and consumers in Colorado? This deal was supposed to be done at the end of 2013. It doesn't surprise me that it wasn't done. Um, and it's really being hung up now in particular by U.S. and Japanese disagreements over automobiles and agriculture. So it seems like we've been here before. So it's a huge opportunity. Um, what I don't like about this Trans-Pacific trade deal, it doesn't include China, doesn't include India, so they're, they're kind of left out. Maybe they would come in later uh, at some point, but here, like the transatlantic deal that's being negotiated, the Trans-Pacific deal, I think, is going to be pushed out into the second half of this decade. So there are two big deals that are very important for commerce for Colorado. Hopefully they'll get done or something maybe, you know, halfway that gets us started that we can finish later on. That would be bullish for U.S. companies. What do you see as a near-term and maybe longer-term economic prospects in North America? And then move us around the world a little bit. Okay. Talk about what, you, what, your, what your big picture is. Uh, well, I'll start with where I'm most optimistic, and it is North America, or even like broaden that out, Western, the Western Hemisphere, um, really from Canada down to Argentina and Chile. There's a lot. If you look at that swath of geography, we have everything the world needs. We have agriculture, we have water, we have energy. We're, we're peaceful nations in general. There's no wars. There's no nuclear uh, tension points. There's no religious uh, extremists. So we're really between north and south, it, it, this is a peaceful swath of the world that the, that the rest of the world needs. And what I mean by that is they need our agriculture. They need our energy. And, it, and the energy is a big story of ours. We've been talking for quite a bit about it, whether it's Canada, the U.S., and Mexico coming forward. So that's, that's a hugely positive. I think you're seeing a lot more U.S. companies shorten their supply chains, putting them in Mexico, taking them out of China. You're seeing companies come back from overseas reshoring back to the U.S. So to me, it's a very positive story. Outside, you know, we still have to look at Europe. I'll start with Europe. I'm a little concerned what's going on in Ukraine, Crimea, Russia, and the tension points between the United States and Russia. And really, what's, it's discouraging because it does impact, I think, the, the mood towards doing a trade agreement, that you know, Russia has divided the United States and certain European countries about Russian sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's discouraging. Um, you're seeing a recession in Russia. Now, Russia's a big market. There's a lot of U.S. companies that are exposed, European companies. So, you know, to me, Europe's recovery, I think it's for real, but it's very fragile. I mean, 1% growth, that's not great. Uh, ECB needs to cut rates much more aggressively, and they're, and they're behind the curve. So we see a recovery out of Europe that's good, but it, it's pretty weak. And, you know, we're, we're, we're about to enter the sixth year of an economic expansion. They're just coming out of their long recession that they had that really started in 2011. So you know, it, it's getting better, but it, hopefully we're, they're not out of the woods just yet. Um, I worry about the Middle East, North Africa. It, it's, a, you know, basically it, it's a colossal mess in terms of the geopolitics related to the extremism on the right uh, or, or in, and the religious right and left, however you want to look at it. There's, there's a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. There's just a tremendous amount of wasted economic potential there. That, that's, it's, it, that's, to me, the, the kind of the bottom line. Mm -hmm. That the, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's North Africa, th there's, there's a lot of economic inputs that they're not happening. So we'll see how that plays out. Africa in general, we're bullish on. Um, we see a lot of opportunities, telecommunications, internet, I, uh, I banking, and so forth. You know, for the really sub-Saharan Africa, so that's coming forward. But the commodity prices that they used to enjoy, the price level has dropped dramatically. And that brings me to Asia and China. And that's China in of itself is, is slowing down. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised. People are surprised when they see weak numbers out of China. Ch China China's human. They, they're going to slow down. They, they grew by 10 percent per annum for three decades. You can't do that arithmetically forever, let alone, you know, in the real world. So I would see, I see what happening in China. Uh, I'm very bullish medium and long term. But here now, they're in a very delicate transition towards consumption, service-led growth, and away from exports and investment. And last week, we've got the numbers from the World Bank that sooner than expected, i.e. The, by the end of this year, China's economy will be larger than the U.S.'s, and that, that's and based on purchasing power parity. 
But that number really doesn't speak to the challenges to China, whether it's the environment, whether it's uh, with the, the new uh, um, labor relations, um, the focus towards less exports, more investment. So there's a lot going on in China. But and having then you got to broaden it out. Something I've worried about, and I picked up on a recent trip over there. There's a real arms race underway. There's real ge geopolitical tension points between China and Japan and now recently, and even today, between China and the Philippines. And caught in the middle, so to speak, is the United States. We're the sheriff, where we, we run, control that part of the world, at least the, the deep water, and we're in the middle. So um, we're bullish on defense. I mean, how do you play that investment-wise? We, we like defense. But, but there's a lot there. Could, could China and, and Japan ever mix it up? I don't think intentionally, but the unintended consequences of an accident could create a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on in the world geopolitically. That to me brings me back to the United States, Colorado, NAFTA. We're, we're very peaceful. We, we're, we're, we're progressing. We've got a lot of challenges. But relative to the rest of the world, we're, we're a pretty stable island amidst all this turbulence. So you didn't mention Korea. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about Korea, South Korea, South the, the economy. economy. Oh, yeah. They're very innovative, they have um, leadership and creativity, they've got global brands, highly educated, um, they're, they're, they've got good companies, and, and that's not true of China, by the way. China does not have global brands. They don't have really some really good companies just mm -hmm. yet. So the macro numbers are improving, um, but to me, it, the, the whole world, what I worry about is if the U.S., if we're gonna go home and become more isolated, you know, kind of pull up the bridge, so to speak, um, then the rest of the world is rudderless. There's no leader, and we need the lead to keep the rest of the world on track. Yet we have to accept that, you know, China's coming along, Brazil, India, and so forth. And I would say, you know, what's, we didn't mention the IMF, but like those institutions have to change to reflect the world that we're living in. But the U.S. won't even fund the IMF, the, the money we said we would fund, which creates its own problem. So here, here in the United States, the biggest risk is just pulling in and with, you know, putting the blinders back on globally as opposed to seeing the opportunity. Let's talk a little bit more about Russia and Ukraine. Do you think these sanctions on Russian leaders, or these financial sanctions, are going to work? No, I think, it, I think it, will they work? Uh, they're meaningful, number one. Uh, number two, will they work? It depends on how w far we're willing to keep tightening screws, broadening them out. Um, how far are we willing to go to cut off capital, um, impose more sanctions and so forth. But already U.S. companies are saying, hey, you know, it's starting to hurt. The European companies are certainly saying to their European leaders, listen, you know, don't go too far because this is going to start to hurt. If you look at the numbers, you know, China, or I'm sorry, Russia has come out of no place to be a huge consumer of a lot of products. And they've got the most mall space in, in Europe right now. They've got big, you know, whether it's PepsiCo, McDonald's, Ford, that's a growth engine that now is threatened. So I think the sanctions are working. But what's, what's clear, though, is it's very obvious that the Europeans have one idea when it comes to sanctions, the U.S. another. The Europeans are much more dependent and, and, and aligned commercially with the interests of Russia. And, we're, and so we can push so hard. And, but if, if we're not on board together, then they're less effective. Well, thanks for joining us today and talking about transatlantic trade. Um, and uh, thanks for coming to Colorado. My pleasure. Thank you.